Hello, First Assembly. Welcome to a, another session of Parenting on Purpose. Thanks for coming back. And um, we're going to go ahead and, and look at our topic for today is heart training. And as I said in the previous session, I, I know that uh, we've already talked a lot about the heart. And you've heard me say a lot about shepherding a child's heart. Um, but um, uh, the concept of the heart, uh, we need to go just a little further with that and the parent's responsibility to the heart. So, um, all right. Our tagline, once again, that the generations to come will know. In the previous session, I talked to you about how um, uh, when we look at that passage in Psalm 78, 1 through 7, the three things that we do and the three things that they do, our kids, the next generation, that they internalize it, that they put their confidence in him, and that they obey him. Well, Mark 12, 30, look, going back to the verse we, we looked at, what Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And remember, he was quoting from Deuteronomy when he said that. And I just want to quickly look at these concepts because sometimes we say them and if we really pause and think, now, now really the big picture is Jesus was saying, love God with all of you, <laughs> love him with everything you got. So in counseling, we often look at a person as um, emotion, intellect, and behavior, you know, those three things and how they work together. And and if you really want to deal with someone's behavior, you've got to go back and deal with the things that they're thinking about or the emotions that are driving the, this and that, you know. And so where does that all come into play? And But we're also spirit, uh, or we have a spirit, right? Or do we have a soul? We have a soul. Well, what's the soul? Doesn't our soul live on or does our spirit live on? And so these concepts, and, and I'm not going to make this too much into a, a uh, it's not going to be an exposition on Mark 1230 at all. But I believe that as Christian parents, when we're talking about these concepts, uh, any concept, be a student of God's word, um, look up things, learn them for yourselves, learn them with your kids. And um, so I just wanted to quickly look at what are these things. The First of all, the soul. What, what is the soul from a biblical, a biblical definition? What do we see when we look in Scripture? Um, well, it's an inclusive word. Um, the soul really means entire life. Um, the body's in there. It's like, yeah, or or some, some say the life force. My soul, my, my living my living being, um, that the idea that every part of, of my life, including my body, must reflect a love for God. That's the idea of, of soul, the, the living part of us. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Again, I'm not diving into f deeply on these things. The mind. The mind includes moral perception and reflection. Um, it includes, uh, includes, of course, reflection is contemplation as well. But when you think of the, all that's involved in the mind from the biblical standpoint, um, considering things, desiring things, having affections, um, having mem putting things to memory, the attitude, um, understanding, all of these things often connecting to the mind. And really what the bottom line, it, again, is every desire all the memories we hold dear, all the attitudes, all the understanding um, must show a love for God. His moral character, his likeness. And the next one is strength. Of course, I'm doing these a little out of order, as you've already noticed. Strength, the ability and capacity for action, the, the ability with all your strength, with all, all that you have, all the capacity in you. So as you can see from some of these, these aren't so clear cut, um, uh, clear cut, concrete type definition. I mean, they're more abstract in a way or maybe a little more figurative in their meaning. But uh, your, your ability, your capacity. So. Uh, the, the idea that our ability and our capacity to act must be directed towards honoring and obeying God. That's the bottom line with with that. And then we move on to the heart, which, again, I want us to be uh, want it to be the main focus of where I'm going 
here this evening. And uh, the heart, it's the, we see in the Bible that the heart is a place where things can be put in. There can, stuff can be put in it and things come out of it. So that's really interesting when it, when you compare the heart to the other things. It's very clear. Things go in, things come out. And then the different descriptors that we see, it's the center of being and personality. So the intellect, emotion, the will, the conscience, um, all of those. And you know, you've you probably already noticed there's some overlap here between heart and mind. And um, and that's okay. There's sometimes, um, of course, taking biblical words and translating them to English. And, uh, you know, sometimes there is a confusion and things are lost. But the the heart is the center of being and personality, my intellect, my emotion, my will. So th the bottom line, every thought we form, every belief we hold dear, every decision we make, every emotion we have and every conscience um, we form should be directed at love for God and, of course, eventually love for others, too, as Jesus later explains in the following verse. So the heart, love it, love. the heart is um, interesting because many times people interchange that word for conscience. And I, I probably will a couple times in this session. Um, I think of Pinocchio. If you remember the song from Pinocchio, and I'm, I'm not going to play it. You can find it on YouTube. They sing that song where he sings it with uh, J Jiminy Cricket, actually. Let your conscience be your guide. And just give a little whistle, just give a little whistle, let your conscience be your guide. Now, from a child's innocence perspective, yeah, I understand what they're saying. But when you think of, is that really how it works in this world? Is that really the best advice? <laughs> like when people say, just follow your heart, that. That's not usually good advice. There are times we follow our heart, heart for God, a heart for to reach out to a person, to love the person over there, a person that needs a friend. Yeah, but boy, there I'm. There are times I'm glad I didn't follow my heart. In, in, yeah. If we followed our heart, how many people would uh, be in trouble? I don't know. So that, but okay, I say all that because. We have to look at the conscience as the heart, not just as the shepherding. I mean, that's that doesn't go away. I've said a lot about that, or at least repeated that a lot. But the, the intentionality to care for the heart, to put things in the heart, is also a parent's responsibility, the Christian parent's responsibility. And this book really gets to the, the idea of what I'm just kind of explain where I'm going. It's written by a, a prof he was a professor at Oxford and Tending the Heart of Virtue looks back at early fairy tales and early children's writing, how it was re intended to awaken their moral imagination. Uh, he mentions C.S. Lewis and the Chronicles of Narnia, the original version of um, the original version of The Little Mermaid, Hans Christian Andersen, was very intentional to include moral lessons in his writings. And so anyway, I, but I like the phrase of it. You, you're welcome to look up that book someday and look at the kinds of literature that would be good to give to your young kids. But tending the heart of virtue, tending, that's what we have, need to be about as Christian parents, but the heart of virtue, that, that virtue isn't just picked up like a cold. But we've got to expose them to it. We have to help them understand what does it mean to be virtuous? Well, for the believers, to love God and love others, to live a life that respects others, to to uh, to show love and honor to those around them, which is ultimately showing love and honor to God as well. So think of heart. It's used 860 times in the Old Testament. The word leb, which is interesting. Because if you uh, ever study Hebrew or look into the Hebrew language, ancient Hebrew, um, the um, the translation can also be lev, lev. It's either lev or leb, and lev, Leviticus, 
the law, le levites lev, so heart, 860 times, used over 30 times in the New Testament. And so the heart is a big part of the conversation from beginning to end, from cover to cover in the Bible. So this is something to not look at lightly. Even Aristotle spoke of uh, a consciousness. And, and now you're saying, well, yeah, but that's not the same. In a way, when you think of the heart, you think of a, a, your conscience. Um, I said that before. And when Aristotle talked about a higher and a lower conscience, the the lower being the the idea that you're born with a certain level of right and wrong. Okay, there's certain things you know from birth without ever being exposed to the gospel and biblical standards. Um, you understand there are some just some things are right and wrong. And then the then the other conscience, uh, which again Aristotle called a higher conscience, is that that can be trained. And so think of that for a practical illustration for a Christian parenting here. The basic conscience, what, again, what Aristotle, or Aristotle called the lower, basic truths are already there, basic sense of right and wrong. But then the moral conscience is trained into the human heart, okay? Um, you, you, leave a, you leave someone without any moral training. Uh, they've got some basic right and wrong, but there's so much more that can be grasped, that can be learned, that can be put into the heart, right? So the moral conscience, and we place values on the heart. A child isn't born with those. Um, the values are, are the things that, yes, a basic sense of right and wrong, but the values that we put in. And again, are you being intentional? Are we being intentional enough to put values in the heart? I, I love the move that was, oh, I mean, it started probably 25 years ago, and uh, oh, maybe more than that, uh, of, of churches and businesses to get on paper what is your mission, what is your vision, and what are your values. Because when you do that, it helps drive you to stay on track, like I talked in a previous session, to, to keep you away from mission drift, that you would just drift into doing something else. So the values that we put in their heart are, are very intentional because we want them to stay on a certain path, a certain journey, right? Loving God, loving others, honoring God in this world with all that's in them. And so this standard, there's there's so much right and wrong in, in this world. There's so many uh, thoughts. There's so many, uh, I, I think I alluded to it in a previous session, that we live in a very... Uh, shame-based culture that it, I mean, it's it's become that so quickly and so much worse than it that ever was. And and I don't want these sessions to be downers. I want you to be encouraged and inspired to to be more intentional and and, and parents and so on. But but the truth is, the world is a tough place. We're watching people get shamed for just believing something from different from someone else. We. Uh, I remember when it felt like the the world is becoming so relative that there's no truth anymore and everyone can believe whatever they want. But that has definitely changed in recent years that you know you're not really free to believe something else because um, if you dare to, you will be shamed um, throughout social media or however. And it's not even let's talk about it, right? It's let me shame you for what I think you meant rather than let me talk to you about clarifying what you said. So uh, this standard of right and wrong is even going to be more important and more important for our kids to be to know in their heart that who I am as a believer and, and why I do what I do as a believer and, and why the biblical principles are, are so important to our way of life. And because it's not getting easier to be a believer in this world. Um, and um, I know you, you think of what Christians have been through, and we've not seen anything like the, the Christians in the early church and the times of Nero and, and um, Christians in the Sudan and, and other places that have, have j just been just wiped out in, in horrific ways. And, but yet to stand for something, that, to believe there, there is a standard that we're going to live by. The standard of right and wrong is written on the heart in order to train it beyond the basic sense of right and wrong, right? 
So the na natural sense of right and wrong, without the aid of biblical training, will not be enough for a child to have a heart that is sensitive and responsive to God. You say, well, he's a really good kid. Or people say, well, I'm a really good person. I hope God lets me into heaven. And it, that's, that's not it. <laughs> and, and we don't let our kids' hearts, we don't, we don't leave a baby uh, to fend for itself. We don't leave a spiritual, a, a spiritual baby, uh, someone who's, let's say an adult who's come to Christ for the first time. We don't just leave them alone. I guess some people have to do. But the same thing, we don't leave our kids' hearts alone. We, and we don't leave the tending of their heart and the training of their heart to, to the professionals or to just the school teachers and the, uh, and the children's pastor or, or those kinds of things. We, we have to be it. We, and again, I hope, I hope you you have that uh, that inspiration. Uh, our kids are a clean slate, and God says, "Here's their heart, here's their life." But I'm going to give you, I'm I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to give you the content, and here's the piece of chalk. And there are times clearly He takes the chalk. Times we have the chalk, but that. The, just the process he puts in our hands as our responsibility is uh, is pretty big. <laughs> it can be overwhelming at times, and it doesn't mean you should shame yourself if you're if you're a parent of a child who's walked away or anything like that. And, and I know that if if you're watching this and um, and maybe you you are not from a Christian background, um, hopefully you can see the what we're talking about as a love for others being the, the badge of what really, being a believer of Jesus should be characterized by, and that a child is a clean slate. And we want to raise them to love people and honor people and be shining lights in this world of, of, of honor and respect and all of those things. And so um, it's, a, it's a clean slate. The moral conscience part is, is a clean slate, and it's up to us. And I like um, when you, we look at Psalms 119. David wrote, Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. What's the action? There's there's a hiding, okay? There's a hiding of something. What's it, what's being hidden? The word of God. Where is it being hidden? It, in the heart. And why? To maintain a right relationship with God that I might not sin against you. And we know the life of David. We know his enormous mess ups we know the the awful things that he was a part of um but yet for him to come back in repentance for him to have a heart for god yes we we know he's he faced the consequences of a lot of things too and i don't, I don't want to get too far off track but that there's a I, I like how this verse lays out the the mission as a parent something needs hid it's god's word where in the hearts of our kids and why to maintain a right relationship with God. It's like the, the picture you're seeing there, the, the hard drives on a computer that it, you have to put things into the computer if you want to process and work on things later. And what is going into it is up to you. You're the caretaker. You're, you're the shepherd that lays at the doorway that should lay at the doorway that protects the sheep at night. And I want to give you, um, I, I told you in a previous session, if there's nothing else you take away, it's the importance of giving a biblical reason why. But here I want to, I want to say that if there's nothing else you take away from this session, it's this illustration of a warehouse. Our children's hearts are the warehouse where values are placed. Biblical values must be placed there to regulate the thoughts and behavior of children think of this uh, let, well let's look at Psalm 119 again just a the heart receives instruction the heart stores instruction and the heart governs instructions okay uh, so think of the ki kids hearts as described in Psalm 119 receiving storing and governing and think of a warehouse all right um, all of those boxes that you see in the photo and, and other warehouses, you think of the warehouses that Amazon builds or Home Depot and other places that have lots and lots of merchandise. Things go in. Things are stored there. 
things are pulled off the shelf according to an order or some other kind of directive. When you put things on the shelves of your child's heart, you're, you're, you're putting things on their shelf so that it can be stored there so that when they have to make a decision, you've equipped them to scan the shelves, take it off the shelf, whatever, and to make a decision based on biblical principles. Again, if we just go back to the basics of loving God and loving others, of being other-oriented people in this world, of serving this world, of pouring out our lives and our hearts and everything to, to give to others, to reach others, we are doing that. So, but here's, here's a problem. Here's a challenge. You're not the only one who's putting things in your kid's heart. You're not the only one in, in, who's putting things in their warehouse. Because they're going other places. They're spending time at school. They're spending time with kids in the neighborhood. They're spending time in with other relatives and so on. And other people are putting things in their warehouse. Now, I don't mean that in a, a seedy way at all. But they're hearing things. They're learning things. They're picking up things. They're... Uh, People on the TV, uh, people uh, across the world on, on, on the, other the other side of a headset playing a video game are putting things into their warehouse. And so the, what I have to ask you as a, as a Christian parent is, are you aware of who's all putting things in their warehouse? And are you putting enough in there to kind of drown out the other stuff? Now, I'm not saying be a controlling, overbearing, authoritarian parent, but I am saying that you have to be even that more intentional to put wonderful, good principles, biblical principles in their warehouse if you want them to live by them, because there's lots of things being put into their warehouse. So hopefully that inspires you to to be more intentional, to talk. We, uh, I've covered this a lot in the previous sessions. Uh, it, it's times of non-conflict. It's uh, times of uh, um, when we get up, when we sit, when we're walking by the way. The, the heart is so, so, so important, and we must tend it. We must be in charge of um, our, our kids' hearts. And you think of the activities of the heart, you know, the negative side, warning us when we're about to do something wrong and then accusing us when we have done something wrong, the feeling of shame and guilt. And then there's the, the other side, the positive, the prompting us to do right. Um, when, when, my, when, my, when my kids would tell me stories of things that they did to, to help someone to make a difference in someone's life, that they were prompted to do it. And then the other part of the positive part of the heart that that then it confirms that we did something right we did something good we we displayed god's love in this world and um the, so that whole the whole warehouse think of how a child searches their warehouse um they they make assessments all the time making assessments in a situation to make choices when ethical ethical circumstances arise how do, what should i do here and what should i do there and and sometimes it's not so easy but hopefully you've been so intentional in their life that you have a relationship, that you talk with them, and you've put so many things in their warehouse that they're able to at least make a decision that points back to a, a biblical principle. Maybe not a, a biblical law, but at least a principle. And so if the value is not written on the heart, it can't be retrieved. If we don't put anything in there, it can't be retrieved. And one of the saddest uh, depictions of this, the, the, the depictions of the consequence is Judges 2.10. And I, as it says there, is this the saddest verse in the Bible? When all the generations had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. That's baffling. That's that's mind-boggling when you think of how close this generation is to the ones before. When you think of chronologically, we have a generation died out 
in the desert because they were disobedient. Then we have the generation, Joshua generation, that went in and took the land. Okay? And then we have the, the, their children. And judges could be their children or the children after. Where the word of God says that they arose who knew not the Lord nor the work he had done for Israel. How can that be? Um, Judges also says everyone did what was right in their own eyes. But how can that be when, when God set up a system where you could talk about the Lord all the time with all these things that were built into the culture? And when the directives were so clear, how is it that the children or grandchildren of those that went in to t- take the promised land, they knew not the Lord or what he had done for Israel? It's, it's, it's heartbreaking. I, and I, I, I'm sure you can feel that, that, that what was lost so quickly. And I, I don't say that to you to scare you. I don't say that to you to put fear and condemnation in you. But I say that to you for an urgency, that if we're not speaking, if we're not being intentional, if we're not putting into their hearts the things that should be there, the good things, the talking about them, having family devotions and prayer and all those things that that are going to come up in this series as well, then we've, we're losing ground. Again, being a believer is not about what we do. We're not earning salvation. But for the sake of our kids, we got to feel an urgency, an urgency that's combined, that, that looks at the times that we live in and looks at how, how quickly faith can become extinct. That we're always one generation from the faith becoming extinct in the family, from the faith in God being gone. Think about that. There's We're always one generation away because a generation can say, and if they do, I understand they grow up and they make choices on their own. And the, you understand from the very beginning, I'm not talking about a authoritarian uh, control at all. But I also want you to grasp this. That when we give these principles to our kids, we are giving them ultimate freedom. Okay? Now... We know the we know the critics, we know the skeptics say, and please, I'm going to give you another disclaimer because I, I I just I have felt so much us and them communicated communicated by the body of Christ to the world, communicated by Christians to the to other Christians when they look at people in the world, and and and, and I even using that term the world I I, I know <laughs> it's if you're watching this and you don't it should never be in us and them people who love god people who live for jesus uh, should never look but what i'm saying is that um people do often look at christianity as something that takes away your freedom as it's binding and but yet when we equip our kids When we fill their warehouse with great things, when we fill their warehouse with the love of virtue, when we fill their warehouse with the love of people, uh, when we fill their warehouse with ideas of how to respond and and how how to be a uh, how to reach out to others and respond to needs around them in this world, we are giving them ultimate freedom because we don't have to be there every time. Okay, the authoritarian parent. The kid has to obey when the parents are around, but they don't have to obey when the parents are not around. Of course, the parent will deal with it later and so on. But the authoritative parent, the biblical parent, the equipping, the empowering parent puts things in there so that the child can be free to make decisions based on biblical principles. Think biblically, think Christianly so that they can live for Jesus. This is a great place to stop. Thank you again for being part of our uh, series, and I hope you'll be back next week as we continue to talk about the heart and our kids and parenting on purpose. God bless. See you next Wednesday.